hello. Um, here I'm, today we're going to talk about VLC in the last release called uh, VLC 3.0. Um, and I'm going to speak about a few stuff about VLC if the screen actually works, doesn't. Okay, give me a second. Yes, okay. Um, so my name is Jean-Baptiste Kempf. I'm the president of the Vidran Nonprofit Organization. I'm one of the oldest uh, still alive and working VLC developers. Um, the older one is at the back of this room. Um, I'm a French geek. Um, I've been uh, working on, uh, on uh, computers since uh, a long time. Um, and I've been doing a lot of stuff on VLC. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, VideoLAN is uh, an organization whose goal is that everyone uses cones on their laptops, even if it makes no sense because it has no, no sense with video. Um, it's a very long story that started a long time ago uh, at the Ecole Centrale Paris, uh, which is the university south of France, uh, south, of, uh, south of Paris, um, 30 kilometers south of Paris. Um, and the story was that students wanted to have a faster network uh, to play video games in the 1990s. And this, um, this campus that you can see is actually a private campus for a public university, which is extremely unusual for France. Um, and so the, the French government couldn't pay for the students' network because it was on the private campus, right? Um, so in order to play video games, of course, Doom, um, and they wanted to have a fast network because their network they had was token ring. I don't know if there are some oldies in the room who knows what token ring is, but it's extremely slow and very lots of latency. Uh, it's fine when you're using MUT and Pine to, to, to read emails and networking, but when you, we want to shoot people that do, well, it's slow. And when you have la high latency at FPS, you die. Um, so they wanted a new network for that. Um, and of course, um, uh, the university couldn't pay because it was a public uh, university on a private campus. So they went to see the people who actually built the campus in the 1960s. And they, it's a big company like, uh, called Bouygues, uh, which is basically building half of the buildings in France. And they had also a TV station. And the guy said, well, we don't understand anything you're talking to us about networking, but the TV station actually cares. Um, because the future of television satellite, lol, um, 20 years later, it's easy to, to, to laugh, but yeah, it's not. Um, and at that time, in 1994, you had like big satellite dishes that cost thousands of dollars. Uh, and decoders that cost also the same, right? And when you have 2,000 students on a campus, you are not going to buy 2,000 decoders and 2,000 satellite dish. I know some people love to have that on buildings where everyone has a satellite dish, but it's horrible and very expensive. So the idea was to put just one big satellite dish on top of one of the buildings and then stream it directly on the network. Okay, today, after, 10 years after YouTube, it's obvious, but we are 1994, the best lab computer is a Pentium 60 and 4086DX, so doing MPEG-2 decoding of SD at real time was like science fiction. But of course, they didn't know that, um, so they actually did it. Um, took them two years to get something, a prototype. Uh, the prototype was great. Um, it, it was working on a huge machine with 64 megabytes of RAM. Uh, at that time, it was huge. Um, and of course, the, the demo was crashing after 45 seconds because it was leaking memory. But that's fine, the demo stopped at 32 seconds and everyone was happy. Um, so that project was called Project Network 1000. There was absolutely nothing open source. But after the project, they said, well, maybe other people will care about that one. And uh, they're starting a new project called Video LAN, because it's a video on a local network. Amazing names, as usual. Um, and that's how the VideoLAN project started. It took them three years to manage to get GPL, uh, because the university wanted to sell this for whatever reason. I think the MIT had MPEG-1 decoders that they managed to sell. Um, so that was the idea. Uh, but in 2001, the project VideoLAN gets open source. Um, and one of the projects, VideoLAN client, became VLC is a popular project. Um, it's important to know that there are other projects on VideoLand that are not only VLC. So the cool, right? Um, completely stupid icon for a media player. It has absolutely no reason and no nothing related to, to video. But it's absolutely genius, right? Because like, who in their right mind would 
user, no one. So it's so distinctive on your laptop, on your computer, on your phone, that you know it. And like 25% of the traffic that comes to a videoland.org website is people Googling on Cone Player. Like no idea what you see. Cone Player. Um, when I go and like anywhere in India, in the middle of nowhere, I say, yeah, you know, I work on VLC. No, VLC, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, the code that plays video. Oh, yeah, yeah, that. I'm using that forever. Um, of course, it's a student joke um, <laughs> that started, but we cannot change it, right? It's so distinctive. Uh, every week we have someone complaining, but it's like, oh, the software is not finished, it's bad. Yeah, the software is never finished until all those users are dead. <laughs> but, um, so, VLC got popular um, because it was actually a software able to play everything. Uh, at a long time ago, uh, when I was young, uh, on Windows you had to download correct packs. So you downloaded a, a video player that was just doing the video player, and then you downloaded the correct pack because you wanted to play something else. And every two or three weeks there was a new codec, a new x version, a new DivX version. And so you downloaded the correct pack, it still didn't work, so you downloaded another correct pack that was fighting with the first correct pack. And now you had no video at all, even the video that you had in the past. And of course, that was a big mess. VideoLand and VLC is a cross-platform project. So, correct packs meant nothing. So, they took the idea of having everything bolted inside the player and put that on Windows. And that was one of the reasons why VLC got popular. The second reason is that VLC was the only way to play DVDs on macOS for a long time. And finally, and of course, none of you ever did that, but at that point, in 2001, 3, 5, when you were downloading stuff on Emule, Idonkey, DC, or whatever other peer-to-peer -peer software, that you of course never did because that's very bad, so don't do that. Um, it took, if you had like a 56K connection, it took you one day to download the DivX. And after one day, you realize that, well, either the file is corrupted, or the James Bond movie you were trying to download was actually a Disney movie, or, or the other way around, right? So we were frustrated. But as VLC was a client of the networking, VLC doesn't care. VLC tries to play it. Well, of course the metadata are not downloaded yet, so you, technically you cannot play it, but let's try it. And so VLC is a very, very resilient player compared to a lot of others, because it was done on a network, uh, for, uh, as a network. And on a network, you can't expect that all the data are coming in the right way. Of course, if you're only post HTTP people, you expect all the data, but normally you don't. Um, so that was one of the reasons why VLC, and it's like jokes, like when you go online, there are people who tell you that uh, if a file is not playing in VLC, the file is broken. Well, uh, maybe just there is a bug in VLC, you know? Um, so we spend a lot of time to actually be sure that we play everything. Um, and like people actually have make like memes and jokes with like, Oh, VLC could even play VHS if you put the VHS in the DVD drive. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Um, except if you have, like, actually, you can play VHS with VLC if you have, like, a, a, a device. But, um, anyway. So, and VLC is popular because it runs everywhere. And when I mean everywhere, I mean, of course, the usual Windows, Linux, Mac, the usual BSDs and Solaris, but also Windows Phone, iOS, Android, and, and the last version still run on OS 2. Yeah, there are probably like five users of OS 2 in the world, and one of them is actually coding on VLC. <laughs> but it's quite interesting because um, the reason why you can, we can do that and VLC is extremely portable is because it was correctly designed. Um, it's very portable because there is a very small core and then lots of modules. And depending on your platform, you add more on or less modules. So when you move to a new platform, you basically just have a new way to output audio, a, a way to output video, and a way to have a kind of UI, and then you got everything that we've supported, all the formats. So VLC is popular. Uh, to give you numbers, we are talking about um, around 1 million downloads per day on our website. Uh, so that's outside of, of course, Linux distribution, that's outside people who love to download spyware with download.com or CNET or all those kind of stuff that in, when they install VLC, they install scam. But that gives you an idea, like already on our website, uh, 1 million per day. Estimation is 450, 500 million users on all platforms. 
Um, this is very difficult because we don't have telemetry or spying uh, that everyone likes to do, even open source software today. Um, but um, it's more than 300, 350 on the desktop and 100 on mobile. Uh, since we started counting, it's around 12, 3 billion. So, just the last thing uh, about um, VideoLAN is a community. For a long time, as I said, it was down, uh, developed by students who were like just in a university, master degree. Um, and now VideoLAN is a non-profit organization that I created in 2008, so way after the project was started. Um, and now the VideoLAN project like gather all multimedia software that are uh, free software. So for example, the VideoLAN Dev Days that we do every year, there is like, if you see there is around 80 people, but maybe like one third or one fourth are actually working on VLC, and the others are working on FFmpeg, X264, X264, or other competing projects to VLC. But that's fine because like we all work together and we benefit from a lot of their software. But it's important to understand that the VideoLand nonprofit does not employ anyone. And that's quite important because like, to have such a large software with so many users and so many platforms without employees from the uh, main uh, non-profit is, I think, extremely rare. So, now I'm going to actually talk about VLC3. Um, so, VLC3 is um, the last release uh, that we did. Um, it was out not so long ago. Um, so, the previous version was called VLC 2.2, uh, Weatherworks. You know this uh, very uh, grumpy witch from uh, this web, because most of our um, code names are from this web. Um, it was out in February 2015, so sorry, three years ago. Um, we had like a .0 and then a quick update 2.2.1. It's interesting because this 2.2.1 was downloading more than 200 million downloads on our website. And that's interesting to get the average user base because as if you count, then people say, well, people did updates and so on. Um, on so on a single version, we had 200 million. Um, it was quite stable, not many regressions, uh, not many people complain, so it should be good. Uh, and it's probably one of the best releases ever since uh, 086, the famous one. So 3.0, uh, another very veterinary. Um, a very stern person again. Um, we are talking around 20,000 commits, 17,000 commits on the core, 3,000 on other way, the same on iOS and Minati. It took us quite a bit of time, um, to be honest, but the reason why um, is that we wanted to do the good things, and also because 2.2 was quite stable, and people were quite happy, it was quite easy to, to, keep, um, uh, to keep it out. Um, one of the Focus was to actually do conversion between the desktop and the mobile versions. Uh, and I think we fixed so many bugs. So, what's the highlights? We have hardware decoding on all platforms um, and by default. And that took us a long time because so many people have broken drivers, so many people don't have hardware acceleration, try to get hardware acceleration on Linux and have fun. Um, but, for example, on the Samsung Galaxy Note 8, we can have 8K decoding. On the last uh, Intel chips on Windows, we got 4K and 8K decoding, and that's on very small devices. So we support now, by default, hardware decoding and zero copy. So uh, the problem is that, as you see, mem copy is murder. Um, it's actually a joke from one of the old VLC uh, contributors. But it's important to know that now that we are talking about 4K videos, 6K FPS, 8K, 10 bits, we're talking about gigabits per second. So if you mem copy a frame, you basically kill your whole reference. Um, and on the desktop, it's almost okay. On the mobile, it wasn't. So the big focus of 3.0 was to get that from the mobile to VLC. We support 360 video, 3D audio, uh, so spatial audio. We have now support for network browsing. Uh, support 10 bit, HDR, uh, and so many stuff. Um, we also spend a lot of time to support like all formats, um, a lot of uh, QuickTime files from the 1990s that were never played by VLC, but fixed, and so many other small issues that we spend a lot of time. So people can remember that VLC plays absolutely everything. Um, last thing, we support Chromecast. 
so many people ask us for that. Um, it was quite difficult because the Chromecast architecture is not done for what we do. Um, platforms, we support uh, a lot of platforms more. We support Windows from XP to 10, Mac to 10.7 to the last, Android 2.3, uh, I think we are the last one to support that, and iOS 7 also. So as I said, big focus is hardware decoding, and we did it on all the platforms. So like Direct 3D 9 for Windows Vista, Direct 3D 11 for Windows 10, Media Collect for Android, VDPIU for some Linux users, VRPI for the others, uh, ML for the others, uh, again, for from Raspberry Pi. Um, and all that is zero copy and zero copy display. And also we now output almost everything in OpenGL so we can do transformations like HDR shaders and uh, transformation in 3D so you can play 360 videos. So as I said, now we can host directly uh, networking shares, so NFS, SMB, uh, DLNA, UPnP. Um, we can also support all the zip and half files, so now you can support uh, SRT uh, subtitles that are auto-detected when they are inside the zip, inside the zip of a network. Um, we spend a lot of time to, to fix adaptive streaming, so that uh, you can have a video that can be played on any networking condition, which is quite important, mostly for mobile. Uh, and we spend a lot of time to get Blu-rays menus to work and DVD uh, over the network. One important thing is that uh, we spend a lot of um, focus on having the libvlc interface so that you uh, to be improved. Um, in the past, VLC like the API to build applications based on the engine wasn't that good, but now we actually use uh, libvlc on Android and iOS and UWP. Um, so now we've been improving this uh, API, and like now you could use um, libvlc to create your own media player without any problem. Uh, and we spend a lot of time uh, doing the bindings for other languages if you don't like C. Um, in 3.0 we have a new subtitle rendering stack. Um, it's quite interesting because um, people think that rendering text is easy. Actually, it's not. Um, and usually you use someone else stack to do that. You use GTK or Qt. But we can't use that because those are not available on Android or on iOS. Um, and if you just use the, 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 the OS rendering stack, it's going to be different from one uh, file to another. And as subtitles get more and more complex, it's difficult. Um, so um, we have a new uh, rendering uh, layout based on Arbus uh, that can actually uh, render complex text layout from Southeast uh, Asian and Indian uh, text, um, and can also support uh, multiple fonts from multiple languages at the same time. So here you can see some Japanese next to some Korean, and actually works. Um, and all this work from a, a subtitle uh, rendering was actually done by a guy who is in the middle of a war zone in Aleppo, in Syria, um, and who has only two hours of internet per day. Um, but said, well, what can I do? And the problem we had is that almost none of the VLC developers are actually uh, outside of Europe. So we have a lot of difficulty understanding what are the issues with complex text layout because we don't need that. And someone who, from an Arabic country is actually uh, able to see those issues. So he fixed that for the last years. And so we have a very nice rendering of subtitled. Yes, VR, as I said. Uh, we support a lot of 360 videos, uh, equirectangular, cube map, but we also support 3D audio up to third order. Uh, I think there is no other software uh, that can uh, render Ambisonic to the third order uh, for people. We've improved, of course, the UI for Android TV and Android, classic Android. We bought it to Tizen, even that no one cares anymore. <laughs> and here is the Apple, Apple TV. Uh, version of 3.0. So now that I've spoke about 3.0, the question is what happens after, right? Because I mean, like, what do we do now? Um, one of the things is actually finishing the VR integration. Um, VR is a mess. There are so many headsets. All of them are incompatible with each other. All of them don't work on the different devices and different OSs. So now that we can play any 360 and any stereo video, we need to display them. So um, we're working on that. It's already quite advanced. 
Um, and then you will be able to, to see actually 3D movies directly on your HMD uh, or your phone if you have a Galaxy S or, or Samsung S. And then we're going to work on VLC 4.0. Otto Trick, he's a vampire photographer, I believe. Uh, refer to the whole this world, 45 books to, to know. Um, we're working on improving the video output architecture to be more efficient, uh, especially because uh, most of the compositors on Windows and on Linux are going to change. Um, and so we want to be more efficient. Um, we're going to rewrite the playlist and the input um, in order to keep timestamp the whole chain, so when you do conversions, the, the video are going to be in better shape. And we're going to change uh, the interface uh, and to have a kind of media library like we have on Android. So one of the good things with uh, input manager rewrite and place rewrite is that maybe we're finally going to be able to have gapless audio. Um, and because now it's almost gapless, but not really. Maybe you have 20 or 50 milliseconds of crop between two items, which is not really good. Um, and if we want to be actually good for audio, we need to have that. Then you're going to ask me, why do you care about audio? Well, I don't, um, but my users do. Um, the thing is that we've learned with the video and project is that you don't fight your users. Even if you think that they are stupid, they shouldn't do something, the user is always right. And also, like, I can't go and tell 20 million people don't do that, right? They say just, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So a lot of VLC usage, around maybe 15 to 20%, is audio playback. And I'm just like, no, use something else. They don't care. Um, so um, instead of fighting your users, maybe they are right and you're wrong, so actually fix it. So we're improving the input for, to improve audio. For the same reason, um, we are going to improve the uh, media library. Because when you want to uh, have audio, uh, you need a kind of media library like iTunes or something, but something simple. So we already have that on Android. Um, it used to be in Java. We rewrote that to C++ so that we can plot it on other platforms. Um, it's now ported already on iOS and on the desktop. And then we are going to use that on the desktop to, to actually use uh, VLC. So maybe a new UI like the version we have on UWP. Uh, which is the version we have on the Windows Store that looks a bit more like that. Maybe something else, I don't know exactly, but we are going to uh, work on that. Finally, um, we have two research projects that are quite interesting. The first one is completely insane. It's called VLC.js. The idea is to compile all the C++ and C and assembly code from VLC to WebAssembly and running inside the web browser. Yes, it sounds insane, uh, but uh, the, the, the standard stack of media playback on uh, HTML5 is extremely annoying and not working. People do horrible stuff like HLSGS where they're demuxing HLS and TS inside JavaScript and then remuxing that to MP4. And there is a big problem with the browsers is that they evolve all the time. So today they support this kind of codecs, but what are they going to support next or in, in, in two years? You don't know that. So um, one of the ideas is to take the 15 years of knowledge of the video and project and um, move that to the web. So you can watch DVDs directly or you want, can watch new codecs. And you can even extend because VLC, as I said, is a sort of module. So you can add a new filter, add a new codec directly inside your web browser. So yes, it seems insane. Uh, it is actually kind of working. Uh, I can't do the demo because Firefox was updated and now it crashes. Um, but we have like now 720p H.264 video directly running on Firefox. The second big project is um, not insane but a bit more difficult. It's hardening VLC. Um, VLC is basically 1 million lines of code but we depend on 70 to 60 library, external libraries. And a lot of them are parsers of decoders and, so, and demuxers. And of course, all of them are actually written in C, so they're insecure. Um, and we're not going to fix all the bugs. It's like impossible, and we will never see one. So instead of actually fixing the bug, VLC is going to crash, but let's try to make it that it's not important if it does. So we are actually working on having a sandbox, um, discussing on how to get a sandbox inside VLC. Usually what you now see is people to have like put the whole application inside a sandbox. That's what you see with flat packs and snap and so on. 
But um, this doesn't work for VLC because I'm going to ask all the permissions, right? I need to have low-level low level hardware access for video, which means that I basically, I'm basically a root. I need to have this uh, low-level access to audio, which means that I have access to your slash dev, and so on. So in the end, you realize that I want all the permissions from the sandbox except the GPS. And I'm sure I will find a reason to use the GPS in VLC. Um, but like, this is bad. So one of the idea is to actually not do that, but put sandbox inside VLC on all the stage of the video decoding pipeline. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We have to wrap up now. Okay. Yeah, give me like two seconds. Um, and so um, to put directly those sandbox inside VLC, and it's quite difficult because you need to uh, move from one module to another around uh, 25, uh, uh, 250 megabits per second from one module to another. But um, it's actually doable, and so we are going to work on that. Thanks. You have questions?